Next, we have Hippopotamus, the newest album from Sparks, who we only found out in the last couple of months was still around. And, well, at least on my part, I'm pretty damn grateful they are. <laughs> It's always good to find out something is still alive, and actually, it's actually good too. Yeah. I mean, as far as I was aware, they were just a one-hit wonder from like the 80s, late 70s, early 80s, and This Town Ain't Big Enough for the Both of Us was all they really did. I didn't realise that their career had continued for 45 years, and, I, uh, well... When I was going through the album listings and I saw that they'd released this album, I was sort of like, wait, is that the same Sparks? <laughs> and lo and behold, it is. I mean, to be fair, it's very difficult for... I mean, it's two brothers, so unless something really bad happened, them not being around any longer would be kind of weird. Yeah, but it doesn't necessarily mean they'd be still making music, though. But, yep, they are. And, well, this album was pretty great. Uh, I wouldn't necessarily say it's politically charged as much as just socially sarcastic. <laughs> Because it's very often poking fun at things like, um, uh, for example, uh, it's not the actual opening song. The opening song is probably nothing, which um, is exactly what it says on the tin. Is kind of very glibly brushing off anything, sort of like, oh, it's probably nothing of interest, nothing to concern me. But... The actual full-on first song is Missionary Position. I mean, it's a little retro, and it's a bit passé. But you know, you just know that it's going to make you feel a-okay. It's not really all for you, is it? <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's all, that, that's essentially a commentary on... The rather bizarre public attitudes towards sex, you know, how obsessed society is with experimenting with just sex in general, you know, whether it's multiple partners or various acrobatic positions that no normal human would be able to perform anyway. It's like you'd be doing the Boston Crab. Anyone who doesn't know the Boston Crab is actually a wrestling move. It's the one where the opponent is on their front and you're bending their legs behind them whilst applying pressure onto their back. And now you know a bit of insight into what I do in my spare time. Um, <laughs> I mean, it's a very interesting commentary on all the attitudes surrounding that. Um, there's a lot of very dark sarcasm and very clear cynicism running throughout all the songs on this album. Um, particularly Edith Piaf, parentheses, said it better. And that's basically, um, it's using the song Genere Gretarian as the framework for explaining how that sort of sentiment is essentially held only by the easily moved and simple-minded. Hmm. It's actually one of my favourites on the album. So check out the video, it's great. Yeah, the video, is it's this strange sort of marionette stop-motion kind of thing and when I watched it, I was sort of like, this is, this is actually one of the best music video. This is not me speaking in hyperbole. This is personal music videos I've seen. I mean, I've seen a lot. And I say this in all seriousness, it's one of the best music videos I've ever seen. It's a very solid video. Um, another favourite of mine is What the Hell Is It This Time? That is, well... I'll say it like this. If you are religious, you might have a problem with that song. Because <laughs> the whole thing is, it's framed as... Okay, we've all known people like this. The people who are constantly asking for help and 
pleading for redemption. I mean, in the past year, I had to deal with someone who was really apologetic about what they'd done. And then they basically turned around and proved nothing has changed. Um, I'm not going to go into that because this is not the time or place. But that is essentially the framing. I'm sure, Pierce, you've had to deal with Pierce people like that. <laughs> I'm going to do myself, I know. <laughs> no, I have to point out. Yeah. But anyway, it's basically framing it as God is the friend who has to deal with those sorts of people 24-7. Especially epitomised in the line, you've asked him for redemption 20 times in the past, and 20 times he's answered, and again you'll have asked. But 20 is the limit and he's now getting peeved. And when he gets peeved, it's got to be believed. It's just a, oh, I, I've had it. I, you've had enough chances. And I, I can imagine that that is, if there is a God, that is the reason why he isn't bothering with our sorry asses anymore. Because he has had it to his wit's end with dealing with our bullshittery. But I'm not religious, so I just say if. Yeah, there's a lot. There's a one thing that stands out to me in regards to this album is a hell of a lot of variety in regards to musical sound as well. Yeah. There are 15 songs here, all of which sound very different to each other, but all sound like they were produced by the same person, well, same group, or duo. Yeah. So you've got a kind of recurring themes and kind of structural integrity. No, no it is meant to be together as a group, mm. but everything sounds also very varied and different as well. Yeah. Which is pretty bloody hard to do, so a very, very solid lineup. It's like Edith Piaf is very much a more classic rock type sound, whereas when you're a French director, which I know is one that really stood out to you, yeah. that's more... Accordions. Sort of. Yeah, it's, all, it's framed in a sort of French cinema and Broadway musical kind of style. And it's all just designed in such a way that you'll never get bored. No two songs sound the same. And you kind of get the feeling that they specifically set out to do that. But the thing is, I've seen... If it was to do that before and I think, oh, we're going to make a bunch of different stuff that should win the same album, it quite often sounds disjointed, disconnected, or you just get a bunch of songs that don't sound very good. True. In this case, they managed to avoid all of those. <laughs> I don't think there's a single song in this album I would don't enjoy or think is a good song. Mm -hmm. Everything has its rightful place. Yeah, there's no songs I would cut. I wouldn't rearrange anything. Um, Life with the Macbeths is a really strong closer. Um, that's a very... Now, it's kind of in contrast with what I was saying about Tori Amos, with how you kind of need an upbeat song. I think because Sparks are so sarcastic, it's much easier for them to end on a darker note. Hmm. This is very much a very kind of downbeat song. Yeah. It's very sombre. Yeah, but a good kind of sombre. It is an album closer. Um... There is too much for me to express in what limited time we have, but this album is very expertly framed, designed, all that sort of thing. Um, it's interesting, it never gets stagnant or stale, it varies things up whenever it needs to. It's you've got fun moments, it's got more serious moments, it's just overall extremely solid. Yeah, um, overall uh, rating, what would you give it? Uh, I think when we last talked about it, I gave it a 4, but I think I might have kicked it up to a 4.5 now. Right. I mean, it's nothing that really makes me think, holy shit, this is amazing, but there's very little I can think of that I would even consider thinking as a, a negative, so... Mm. Um, just as a bit of background information, this is the second time we've had to record the episode, because for whatever reason, Pierce's recording ended up going wrong. Um, not his fault. The computer just went berserk. <laughs> It just, the entire thing just broke on me, and probably sort of reloading it in and everything, and just nothing. Yeah. I just had a void. I, I can't explain it. Technology. Yeah. The only way we can really explain it is technology. It's a shit. It's a bummer. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> also, the amazing Mr. Repeat is kind of uh, appropriate as well. Mm. This album was about us all along. <laughs> uh... <laughs> 
Turns out we're sparks. We found a time machine and went back to 1972. <laughs> um, but yeah, my personal score. Now, I normally give six out of fives to albums if I think they're absolutely perfect. This album, this album, I am giving a seven out of five. Now, what that means, we've said about how Five out of five is the amount that would be changed is negligible. Six out of five is I would not change anything. Seven out of five is this album is what I want to hear all the time. I would happily sit down and listen to this album every day for a year. This is a transcendent album to use very pretentious language because we are pretentious twats at times, but whatever. <laughs> But yeah, if you like music, check this out. If you don't like music, why isn't it a music podcast? That's a question. <laughs> but yeah, that's it for this section and the clusterfuck group predominantly. Because I listened through all of the albums I made notes on, I'm going to do the honourable and dishonourable mentions on my own. Pierce, if you feel so inclined, I'll hit you up on some of the honourable and dishonourable albums that I know you listen to. I know you listen to a few. Yeah, some stuff, yeah. yeah, we did originally intend for this section to have four albums in it, but one of the albums neither of us can really remember, so it's sort of like, pff, fuck it. <laughs> yeah, it happens. Yeah. Next episode will be Lindsay Sterling's Warmer in the Winter. It's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. Edith B, I've said it better.